chair at the Center for New Medicine, and I've been working for Dr. Keneally for 13 years now. And it's been just a wonderful experience for me because Dr. Keneally is, you know, uh, in my opinion, and I'm sure all of you, the cutting edge doctor in regards to new research. So it's really exciting because I'm always getting to be pushed into positions where I'm having to learn and get a manual and be an expert on Monday. So it makes it really fun. Um, most of you I have seen personally in some of my uh, sessions, so for those of you who don't, I hope you guys have a, a great uh, experience tonight and come and do some of the work that I do here at the Center for New Medicine. So as we can see that when you're born, you have more than over 200 toxins. When they check your blood, over 300 toxins in the body. And again, these are toxins that we're exposed to from even in the womb. And unfortunately, we really don't have any control over our environment. But what we do have control over are the choices that we make. And so for this reason, it's why we are doing this lecture tonight, so that you can have tools. And so for example, some of the diseases that we're going to talk about tonight are the diseases that you can influence in a very positive way to really, I say, to not have them at all in your life. Most of the diseases are based on lifestyle decisions that we make. Why is this happening? Because we have an overpaced lifestyle. You wake up in the morning, it's rushed to get the kids off to school, rushed to get to work. And so it's, it's a lifestyle that's really unnatural in regards to our present rhythm of how we live life. The air we breathe, the water we drink, the chemicals that we use in our hair products, our cosmetics, the foods, the tin, the mercury, it's ever exposing us. And unfortunately, we don't have a choice often in what we can't see, but we do have a choice in what we can actually purchase and bring into our home. Six million people die every year from air pollution and pollution in general. 3.5 million die from indoor pollution. And you would think to yourself, wow, indoor pollution? That doesn't even make sense. The carpet, the chemicals you use, the paint you use, the clothes, the fabrics. 3.3 million die from outdoor pollution. And honestly, this is, you know, ridiculous. It's just got exponential in terms of the exposure that we're getting on a day-to-day -day basis. The leading cause of death, as you can see here, heart disease still is the top leading heart cause. And of course, lifestyle influences it greatly. Cancer, again, lifestyle can influence it greatly. Many of my patients say, you know, I've been living a life of a pretty conscious vegetarian diet. I've, you know, uh, been very conscious of what I do, how I live, and yet they get cancer. So really, cancer is something that is what we would consider an overload principle. That the body, the immune system is not able to cope and therefore we start creating more degeneration within the body and then these exponential cells that uh, start to create the tumor itself. Uh, Alzheimer's, it's interesting, I was uh, watching a video on the Alzheimer's Summit and one person every, every three seconds is diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia. That's unbelievable. And so when we start to look at lifestyle and the many things that we can actually do on a day-to-day -day basis, we can really ward off the onset of most of these diseases. There's over 100,000 chemicals that are used in America and 1,000 new chemicals that are introduced every year. The problem is we don't know what the interaction of all these chemicals are doing to our body. And this is where the overload principles begin. With the medications, over three medications, the interaction becomes astronomical in regards to our health. Other toxin burdens that we experience, uh, besides what we're exposed to, is our own metabolic slog off. Everybody in this room has been exposed to everything that's on this slide here, from parasites to viruses to bacteria to fungal. Uh, we, I, I call it the, uh, the, the milieu, the terrain of the body is like an ocean. There's many species in our GI system or in our body, but if they are all uh, cohabiting fine, we don't get illness. But when one is overproducing, as I say, if the jellyfish decided to overproduce, we'd have a big problem in the ecosystem. Same as in our body or in our gut. And so if we do seasonal detoxification, and I always say, you know, we just kind of go down the line in terms of addressing uh, a lifestyle so that you have very low sugar, so that you're not feeding cancer, you're not feeding candida. It's interesting to note that a cancer cell has about 91 receptor sites for cancer, uh, for sugar, and a healthy cell only has four. 
So when you go to an oncologist and they don't tell you that, you know, your diet matters, well, that's extremely, you know, in my opinion, really a, a, a very um, toxic approach to heating. So we really need to know the effects of what it is that we put into our mouth. Uh, the amalgam that we have, most of the generation, that our children don't have the amalgam that we did in terms of our generation, we just automatically didn't really have a choice. But each one of those amalgams, every time you have something hot in your mouth, it releases mercury vapors. When you take your amalgams out, it's a 30-year shelf life. And often my patients will say, oh, I said, well, do you have any um, you know, mercury in your mouth? No, no, I took it out 10 years ago. And I would say, well, did you ever do any chelation? They said, no. And I said, well, you know, I'm showing the heavy metals, you know, when I do scans on that you've got a heavy metal of mercury. They're like, wow, I took that out 10 years ago. And I said, well, it's a 30-year shelf life. So anytime you take any mercury out of the mouth, you have to do some form of chelation. Uh, I'm going to be explaining that as we go along. So as you can just see here, you know, you can look at all of this and you can say, well, you know, all of us are exposed on a daily basis, which affects our hormones. Uh, pesticides and herbicides and plastics, they're all hormonal mimics. And so it creates a, a very unbalanced and we create more uh, oxygen deficiency within the cell. Disease begins in the gut, so I would say that's the first place where we really want to start. We want to start by cleansing the gut. Uh, I would say that over 30 to 60 percent of your immunity is in your gut. And so when people ha have issues of constipation or bloaty gas or heartburn, you know, we take it very seriously. It's not just an uncomfortable situation, it's a situation of your health. And so when I tell patients when I do scanning on them that they've got parasites, you know, they get kind of shocked. And I said, how can we possibly have parasites? And I said, well, do you eat sushi? Do you eat uh, raw foods? And even if it's organic, I mean, parasites have no boundaries. And, I'll, you know, people will kind of take it back a little bit, but I say that every human being living has parasites. Again, if we're all, you know, cohabiting together and, it, it, with, you know, the species with each other, we, our immune system is strong, then we can, you know, keep up with uh, even the slog off. The problem with the parasites is their excretion is what's the problem, and it's like, you know, pure ammonia. So when people have insomnia issues, I always say, let's check for parasites because ammonia can keep you up at night, give you insomnia. So 80 to 90% of the population, you know, with ill health or not, have parasites. So this is something that everybody should do at least twice a year. In fact, you know, uh, the whole uh, idea of the six-month checkup uh, was so that the doctor could actually supervise your parasite detoxification. I said, well, we deparasite our animals, you know, twice a year. Why wouldn't we do that for ourselves? And so this is just something that we would say is uh, just basic standard health in regards with one of the things we do uh, on an annual basis or every six months. And so a lot of patients, when I say, how's your bowel function? They say, good. And I say, oh, so you go two times a day? They say, no, I go every three days. And so then that's good because that's the pattern that they've had for their entire life. And so I kind of, you know, say, well, it's kind of like a Play-Doh factory to some degree, you know, so it's like uh, yesterday's uh, dinner, uh, breakfast, and lunch is, you know, pushing out today's breakfast. And so we don't want that. We want to be able to have good bowel function because, again, you know, your, uh, your, immune, your immune system, not only in the gut, but your lymphatic system is directly connected to the intestinal tract area. So all of those toxins that are in there are going to be exposed into the blood. And so it's really important to have good bowel function and not just once a day, twice a day is really kind of what we're looking for. Most people don't have enough fiber in their diet, and especially with low-carbohydrate diets that, you know, anybody who is suffering from any kind of ill health has to go on a very, very low-carbohydrate diet. So we take a lot of the grains out of the diet, a lot of the fiber, and so one of the biggest complaints that we get is people get, you know, constipation issues. So one of the fixes that I have them do is just, you know, using things like chia seed or psyllium husk. I say take a tablespoon of uh, psyllium husk, put it with a little bit of almond milk, cinnamon, and a little stevia, you know, four ounces of water uh, with the almond milk, shake it up, and it tastes like a little cream of rice, and it's excellent, and it makes you feel full, it satiates you, it expands in the body. I, I like to use it even for cravings, because fiber suppresses a hormone called ghrelin that makes you feel hungry. So I always tell patients, if you don't get enough fiber in your diet, to even just do that two times a day, will act like a scrub brush in your intestinal tract, uh, which is so important. We also want to correct the biome of the gut. So when patients have bloating, gas, and heartburn, the first thing we want to do is we want to look at their enzyme production. Are they deficient of hydrochloric acid? Uh, as we get older, after the age of 30, our production of uh, hydrochloric acid goes down 
significantly. I tell pa patients, they say, well, how do I know? You know, I go, I have heartburn. How could I, you know, um, not have enough acid? And I say, well, the best thing to do is do yourself a, a, a challenge in terms of the enzymes uh, digestion. If you uh, take about a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar and about four ounces of water, and you drink it while you're making dinner, and you, uh, and you don't have any kind of acid reflux, then you needed HCL in your system. Most doctors, when you go uh, and you complain of heartburn, immediately they give you some sort of an antacid to suppress any hydrochloric acid that you might have had, which is really you know, not the cause of what, why you're having the heartburn itself. And I tell patients, well, if that uh, apple cider vinegar didn't work, then you know, after you eat and you're experiencing heartburn, just take a little bit of baking soda, put that in water. If that subsides it, then truly you are one of those people that have extra hydrochloric acid in, as far as your production. So that's a very easy way to tell whether the digestive enzyme uh, that you need needs HCL or does it need to be a plant-based enzyme. But we've got to replenish those enzymes, and one of the best ways to do it, of course, is to eat you know, plenty of good raw foods in the diet uh, so that you can get the enzymes. When you cook a food, obviously, you're going to uh, kill the enzymes. You won't kill the minerals, but the live enzymes won't be there. So digestive enzymes are very, very, very helpful. We also want to uh, you know, not only work on you know, uh, the bio of the gut through enzymes, but we want to, and detoxification of parasites, but we, we want to re-inoculate. And so that's going to be with probiotics. And we screen you. We do uh, LSA testing to make sure that if, you know whatever we're going to give you is compatible. It's like kinesiology testing, muscle testing. You know which probiotic you need. And we may have 20 of them, but which one did you trigger that would make you strong? So it's important not to just take something off the shelf. I tell patients, you know, they can do their own kinesiology checking by. Um, a, a very simple method to do actually is that uh, you just stand straight and you kind of you know have a gaze about 45 degree angles right out in front of you uh, your body doesn't lie so you say something in a positive uh, that's positive uh, true to be like your name so i would say you know my name is liliana which is a true statement my body if my right and left hemisphere of my brain are communicating with each other uh, it being a true statement my body should go slightly forward and then i would say okay my body did go forward on a true statement um, now I'm going to say something that's untrue, and I would say, my name is Sam. If my body went back this way, uh, then my right and left hemisphere of my brain are speaking to each other. So I tell patients, you can take a product, you know, if you're not certain, and or a food that you might be wanting to eat, and you just put it up here by your thymus, and you would say, uh, in a true statement, this is safe and appropriate. And if your body goes forward, then that product more than likely will be suitable for you. If it goes back, it, I do this all the time when I'm doing vitamins, because sometimes I need some vitamins, sometimes I don't. Sometimes it might be overload principle. I check with myself. You, know, I have, you start to get a little bit of intuition in regards to you know, what your body needs, and uh, that's a really easy method. But of course, you know, with our testing we do, I can just you know, run like 100 products through you very quickly, and it can, it can scale it out in what products do best with you and which ones uh, aren't compatible. And so uh, many patients ask me, well, how do actually toxins enter your body? I said, oh my God, a multitude of ways. You are breathing, you, you're getting exposed to that virus, bacteria, you're walking barefooted. I mean, parasites can go right through your skin. Um, you're putting, uh, you know, your hairspray. It, it's funny, I went to the hairdresser and she was, you know, putting some hairspray because I was going to do a photo shoot. And I was like dying of toxicity. I thought, oh my gosh, you know, because at home I've got everything natural. But I was doing a photo shoot and I, I walked out of there just completely, like almost fainting. Uh, because when you're not used to it, boy, does it hit you fast. And it was really, uh, really quite interesting. So, so we, we're exposed <coughs> a variety of ways that, you know, we're not really conscious of. So it's very important to... Um, Everything that you do, you should be of natural nature. The only thing that I was using, uh, that was probably about five years ago, was my hair dye. I thought, oh my gosh, I'm not going to give that up. <laughs> until I finally decided, okay, I'm going to try natural. And the natural works just as perfect as the other. And that was great. So now everything that I use is not going to be harmful. And that's very important. So the effects of toxicity, as you can see here, you could probably uh, look at this slide and say, oh my gosh, you know, I definitely fit into three or four of these categories. You have to understand that your fat cells are your garages. So anything in excess, your body's going to start storing it in fat cells. And so when people come to me for a, uh, a weight loss class and they want to uh, uh, you know, lose weight, I try to get them to understand what, we, what you really want to do is you want to detox. And that you've got to be patient for the time that it takes for your body to actually be able to excrete these toxins out. And so this is why you know, when patients come to us, 
we really screen them in regards to how their liver is functioning. If somebody's got a fatty liver, then they're not going to be breaking toxins out as well as someone who doesn't, and they won't be losing weight as well. A lot of patients are really frustrated. They say, everything I do, you know, I'm doing so many things that I'm not losing any weight at all. And then I start to say, okay, well, let's look at your methylation. Let's look at your ability to detox. Let's, let's do a screen on your liver. Let's see if you have a fatty liver. And often we find things that, you know, they were completely unaware of, but that are inhibiting them from moving forward in their progress. And so, again, uh, it, our goal is not to dwell on uh, all of the toxins. It's but what to do about it. But making you aware that you have a choice. You have a choice to uh, start eating foods that are of quality nature. You have a choice to uh, not be bringing things into your home that are going to be uh, toxic fumes for your children and for those uh, uh, that come into your home. So why should we detox? Our goal is that we all want to feel better. We all want to live longer. We all want to have a sense of vitality. And we really need to think like anything else that if we didn't take the garbage out of our house, our house would be very stinky. And so if we look at this body as a temple that houses our soul, if we walked into any sacred place, it didn't matter if it was a church or a temple, we would have some sense of honor. We would have some sense of um, respect. We wouldn't go start graffitiing the walls of the temple or the church. So why do we do that to our body? And we say, oh, well, we can get away with it, you know, just this time. But in actuality... We can't because of the overload principle that we're experiencing in our air quality, in our water quality, and in our food quality. And you know, the, the, the ground is devitalized of its minerals, so even when you've got organic food, it's not what our parents had you know, 25 years ago. The quality is going down significantly. So therapeutic analysis. So being at odds with nature and our environment are the root cause of a host of the modern chronic diseases that are rapidly becoming epidemic, astronomically growing in an epic size. It's just amazing. <coughs> Humans can only maintain long-term health if they live in accordance with the rhythm of nature. What does that mean, the rhythm of nature? We live in a very false illusion of life. We can stay up all night long with lights, so we're not following the, the, the whole lunar cycle. We can, you know, uh, be uh, exposed to our cell phones, the computers. All this electromagnetic field uh, takes, us, uh, takes us out of the biorhythm. We wear shoes all day long. When do we get to ground ourselves? How much stress can we handle before we maladapt? And so we really get out of the natural rhythm. I ask patients, you know, what is your relationship with nature? They just look at me like, what does that mean? Like, well, when was the last time that you took your shoes off and went walking on the beach? Or when was the last time that, you know, you actually laid on the ground, uh, the grass? I mean, I don't even like laying on the grass because I think, oh, my God, there's pesticides on this grass. You know, I'm not about to do that. But I really make time to ground myself, to get into nature, to go hiking. And, of course, you know, you've got shoes on. So when can you be barefoot? Be barefoot in your home. Be barefoot on the beach. Anytime you have an opportunity, uh, it makes it so that we can demagnetize and, and have that negative uh, ions that we're experiencing that causes good health because all things that are of a, uh, a toxic nature are what we call a positive spin. And so nature is really one of the best medicines that I always say. Uh, you've got to incorporate that in your life. When was the last time you went dancing? When was the last time you really cut loose and had a good time and laughed your heart out, the tears came out of your eyes? And, you know, I mean, now we say the other side of sorrow is laughter. And so people are just like, wow, you know, I, I can't remember the last time I cut loose and had a good time. So we're very uptight. And so, of course, this is causing more rigidity, more acidity, and then, of course, it affects the gut because our gut is our second brain. So whatever we're experiencing on the outside, we're going to experience here. Then we're going to have lack of digestive capacity. And then we start to go away. So supporting our natural rhythm, there are 10 to 100 times more toxins in one's fat. So as I said before, our fat cells are our garage cells. When our fat cells are full, what happens? We start dumping in the liver. And so again, I, it, it's interesting to note too that I have many patients that are not overweight, that have a fatty liver. Mm -hmm. And so you're kind of like scratching your head a little bit, and so you're just like, wow, that doesn't make sense. But then what makes sense is that they have what's called an MTHRF gene mutation. They don't detox very well. And so most doctors do not test this. You know, it's an additional test, an additional cost. 
But that's always something to kind of think about. Well, you know, I've been on a detoxification program. I haven't lost any weight. And um, actually, I don't really feel that good because my body's dumping all these toxins into my bloodstream. And I actually, I feel worse than when I started. Well, then you might think for a moment that you have an inability to detox those toxins out of your, out of your, out of your body, out of your fat cells. So one of the most important things is to move, to stimulate the lymphatic system. Interesting to know that your lymphatic system uh, is only stimulated by up and down motion. And so listen, we walk all day, we sit all day, we don't, we don't jump. And so it's really important. Uh, I like to use the rebounder because that is very um, low impact on the body. Anybody can do it. You don't need to jump up in the air. There's little teeny, teeny little bounces. But it helps to, uh, every time we jump slightly, it, it kind of squishes our red blood cells and out comes toxin. I like to get on the rebounder and then I actually, you know, manipulate. I take my hands as I'm jumping and I'm just kind of moving through all of the lymph sites and just kind of assisting it. And again, you know, 5, 10, I like to do about 12 to 15 minutes. But that's something that anybody can do. It's inexpensive. I say if you don't have a rebounder, just stand there and, you know, bounce and shake. You know, get out of the shower and just bounce and shake. Shake for three minutes. And after three minutes, your whole body's tingling. And that's the lymph system that's been activated. You have more lymph fluid than you have blood. And so, of course, the lymph fluid is based upon the quantity of water that you consume. And everybody's so dehydrated. You know, we don't have time to drink water. I mean, literally, if water isn't sitting at my desk, I won't remember to drink it because I go from one patient to another. So, again, that water has got to be vis visible, and you've got to take little teeny steps, uh, not just try to chug and say, okay, I haven't drank enough water. I'm going to just, you know, drink as much as I can right now, and then it just passes right through you. And, of course, we want to have good quality water. We're going to talk about that. Uh, but I love, I, I love anything that's movement. I love anything that's nature so I can get out and start connecting and seeing the beauty and, and the little flowers blossoming and then the dog. So you get very stimulated. It's really important to have that visual stimulation. Weight training is essential because, first of all, you know, we start to lose our muscle mass after about the age of 25. We start losing percentages of that. And so um, even with things like walking, there's not enough impact on the skeletal system uh, to keep the density of your bone. And so as we age, uh, weight training is absolutely essential. So I say, you know, every other day would be great. And then another uh, type of uh, cardiovascular aerobic exercise the other day, bicycle riding. I love bicycle riding. You're outdoors. You can make it as easy or as hard as you want. If you do heels, it's hard. If you, you know, on flat, it makes it uh, very easy. So that's something that if you don't have any problems with balance, is just a fabulous way to exercise. I love yoga because it's very calming to the nervous system. At the same time, it forces you to be very present in your body. You're breathing, you're exhaling. And so again, you know, a lot of people, you know, uh, they don't do things because they don't think they know how to do. And so there's so many videos uh, that, that are accessible to us that are free, little podcasts that you can just turn it on and, you know, do 10 or 15 minutes and you go, oh, this felt really, really, really good. So again, I think it's really important to incorporate some form of movement that you're causing up-down motion, that you sweat, because if you're not creating any overload principle, then you're really not going to accelerate in regards to moving forward with your um, your health in regards to exercise. It's really important, again, you know, following the natural rhythm is to go to sleep at the right time. Between 10 and 2 o'clock in the morning is when your body literally repairs itself. So if you're not asleep, then you're missing the whole repair cycle. And, you know, that's essential. I mean, especially as you start to get older, your sleep isn't as great as it used to be. And so we need agents oftentimes to help us sleep, you know, like melatonin, a little 5-HTP, a uh, little chamomile tea, herbal tea, just to kind of calm us down. I tell patients, don't watch TV at least an hour before you go to sleep. Do not take any electronics into your bedroom, your iPhone, your computers, because that's very stimulating. Uh, and, and again, uh, anything that's going to be overstimulating to the nervous system won't allow you to sleep very well. Don't overeat, which is really important. I tell patients if they really want to uh, create a, a good health, just follow the natural rhythm of the body in regards to, you know, the cycle of breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And that's it. Don't eat in between your meals. Have a four to five hour period span before each meal so that your body can actually burn fat for fuel. I mean, literally, your body doesn't even begin to burn fat for fuel until after three hours after your last meal. And so if I'm eating every two and a half hours, when do I access the fat that has the toxins in that I want to dump into my blood system that I want to move out? I won't. And so patients are always kind of, you know, what? I thought you're supposed to eat every, every couple of hours. If that was going to be more metabolically active, you'd burn more calories. 
And I said, well, no, because if, when insulin is in, influencing your blood, you're not burning an ounce of fat. And that is, your insulin is in your blood for three hours until after, after you've eaten a meal. So between four and five hours is essential when you're doing detoxification. You have a, a you know, longer time between each uh, meal. And then again, you know, that intermittent fasting is after your dinner, don't eat anything at all. You burn the most fat between 10 o'clock, uh, uh, yeah, between 10 and 2, you burn the most fat as well. So during the repair cycle, what energy do you think you're using? You're using fat. And so again, if you eat after, let's just say 7 o'clock, and you, and you eat at 10 and 9, 11 o'clock at night, forget it, you will not access fat for fuel. People who have diabetes, they are hotter because their body's literally breaking down their muscle tissue for energy rather than their fat. So it's really essential in order for you to maintain a good sense of detoxification and the lifestyle, don't eat after dinner. You can have a cup of tea. I kind of make it a religion. Every time I have dinner, I go, I finish dinner, I go straight to the stove, I put the teapot on, I make myself some chamomile tea, a little almond milk, a little bit of stevia. That just kind of creates that little soothness of something warm, something sweet. But again, I'm not impacting my digestive system. I'm not creating an overload principle. I'm 80% full, so I've left a little bit of room for digestion. These are really little simple things that we know to be true, but we just don't do it. It creates more burden to the liver and makes it more difficult for us to detox. So again, between 2 and 4 o'clock is when the body breaks down its toxins. And I tell patients, especially if they have compromised immune systems, do not eat animal protein after 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It takes 8 hours for your body to break down the amino acids in animal protein. And so 8 hours later from 2 o'clock uh, is 10 o'clock at night. It's the exact time that my body actually needs the amino acids. If I eat at 6 o'clock meat and 8 hours later it's 10 o'clock, it's going to be 2 o'clock in the morning. Well, at 2 o'clock in the morning, my body's not looking for amino acids. It's looking to break down the toxins. And so that protein, it becomes burdensome to the liver, and you can end up locking what we call the locked protein into your joints if you have more arthritic issues or if you had a tumor potentially in a tumor site. So for people who are compromised, who have a fatty liver, who have immunity issues, say vegetarian meals at night period, and you sleep so much better, you detox so much better, uh, and you don't impact the digestive system or the liver. So disturbed sleep is also, uh, you know, uh, very difficult because it creates a cortisol issue within the body. And so, of course, of course cortisol is a stress hormone. Stress hormone is going to activate the need to dump more glucose in the bloodstream. And so now you have this vicious cycle of your insulin resistance pattern you're setting up. And so it's very important, you know, that if you feel anxious before you go to bed, do a little bit of yoga, listen to some melody, uh, melodic music. What I like to do every night is I just um, lay on the floor, I put my, knee, my feet up on top of a, a bench that I have, I put my arms out to the side so that my adrenals are flattened onto the floor, and I just do some breathing exercises. It just completely grounds me. So again, if you just do these little tricks, you know, it helps you to calm down uh, so that you don't have these little surges of cortisol, you know, rising, affecting your sleep uh, and causing blood sugar issues. Uh, clearing emotional stagnation, I can't tell you how important this is. And everybody's got it. It's not that, you know, uh, okay, I, I process, I know how to do this. Uh, your body has got uh, tissue memory. Anything that is too high uh, in regards to super excited in life or super tragic in life, your brain's really not distinguishing, you know, good, bad. It's distinguishing the intensity of that emotion. I mean, you've heard of uh, situations where uh, somebody got so excited they had a heart attack. <laughs> okay, so the thing is, is that too much energetic excitement to the body can cause an imprint and lock it into the organ tissue that's weak. And so when I work with patients, and because uh, you know we think on the German philosophy that every disease has an emotional component. Some of the tools that we use to discover that, because oftentimes patients can't access that consciously. And so I said, okay, well let's speak to the subconscious mind. And we have a machine called the E-Box, and the E-Box is fabulous because it allows uh, you to just be in a present state to allow the subconscious mind to come up with the areas that it needs to work on in regard to emotional stagnation. And so, um, <clears throat> so for example, people will wear a microphone. They'll speak in the microphone for 40 seconds. I'll be able to pick up the patterning of their voice and then tell them, okay, what I'm seeing is um, a critical voice. 
and then we talk about that critical voice, and it's really uncanny. People will go, wow, you know, you were dead on with that. I'm not dead on with it. It's your body. It wants to be able to release these. And so with a, an environment that's very safe, you can come up with things that we really need to clear. I do a lot of Psych K just to look at uh, the patterning of pe uh, people's belief systems. And so many people are running their filter through a belief system that has nothing to do with them. I tell patients when I see the patterning come up over and over again, let's just say uh, it's uh, emotional disconnect. And I say, wow, you know, uh, we did four different readings and emotional disconnect, you know, keeps coming up in each reading. I'm going to say, and I said, what, what that is, is transgenerational. That was programmed on a genetic DNA. And so we would think, wow, well, how do we, how do we handle that? Well, when you do this kind of work, it actually, it moves back and it moves forward, releasing the patterning of the generations past and also the future generations forward. So it's really awesome. It's very exciting uh, work that we are doing here in regards to clearing emotional stagnation, which is so really important. Uh, anger, uh, fear, grief, those are all things we all are going to feel. But how do we express it in a healthy way so that we don't create stagnation? And so communication is really, really uh, uh, most important. Psychoneuroimmunology, this is big, okay? There's science behind this, and it supports the findings that there's actually a disease personality. And it's really interesting, you know, when we see patients here, and you can kind of get an idea of those patients that potentially are going to have a greater success at healing. They feel full. They feel love. They feel life is abundant. They feel that the world is a safe place. And so, again, you know, we really want to take a look at when you don't feel that, because honestly, no one can make you feel anything. And so if we kind of look at it and just say, why am I feeling that? Well, what is it that is potentially, I'm not seeing it correctly, or uh, I'm uh, potentially processing it in a way where it's not a positive benefit. Everything in life has a positive benefit. Even disease has a positive benefit. What did you learn from it? I said, we don't learn from what we have, how will we grow, and if we don't grow, we'll get it back. Even wait, if you don't believe that you actually can be a thin, healthy person, you'll get your results for a period of time, but then in six months, you'll get it back. Even if you're a person that has a disorder, a dis-ease within the body, if we don't work on, one, your belief system that I deserve to be healthy, I deserve to uh, have vitality, I deserve, cancer wasn't born in you, it's a product of. And so when we really work on that, we work on the foundation of healing because we give people an opportunity to take a really good look at what's going on in the conscious mind and then reprogram the subconscious mind, just like any computer, it's no different. People say, oh, you know, it took me years and years, you know, to, to have this anchor patterning, and I don't know, it's going to take me years and years to get rid of it. And then I just kind of, you know, sit back and say, that's your belief system. You know, it can happen for somebody else in a second, but it can't happen for you. Why? Because honestly, all you have to just do is change the way you think about it, and then how you feel about it. So you begin to learn how to adapt and you begin to learn how to respond so that it's to your higher benefit. It's not constantly wearing on your immune system because your immune system is constantly being um, stressed by your emotions. So some traits that support healing are enthusiasm, alertness, responsivity, curiosity, sense of self-esteem, contentment, gratitude. So those are all things that increase our immune system, uh, helping to support a disease-free life. The attributes of a healthy piece of person is their ability to be able to express their anger, to re express their emotions appropriately, and to release and, and, and forgive. I tell patients, every night, just do an inventory, and just say four things. And these four words are powerful. When I started doing it, I kind of thought, well, this kind of sounds funny. It kind of, uh, you know. But then I started saying it with more power and more intensity. Then I could kind of feel it through my body. And I say, wow, well, something's happening here. And those four words were, I love you. I'm sorry. I forgive you. And I love you. And I say, it doesn't even have to be anybody 
you know, they have done anything wrong to you or at you. But if you feel any kind of, you know, toxicity, whether you got in an argument with someone at work or, you know, uh, you're angry for whatever reason, you don't even know why, you're hungry, you're whatever, you just take a little inventory and you just say, you know, whatever congestion that lies within me, I want to release and let it go in a healthy manner. And just those four words are extremely powerful to unlock. Just because remember, within you is the emotion. You can have an altercation with somebody else. You don't know how they feel. You don't know how they adapted. You don't know, you know, if they walked away and just never thought about you compartmentalized again. But you are stewing with it. So all we really care is how you move these things out of you. And then as you move it, you untie any other relationship that you have that potentially is attached to that uh, negative experience. So stress management is really important. I love yoga, as I said before. But again, connectedness is really important. Meditation. A lot of my patients say, oh, it's so hard for me to meditate. I can't keep my mind still. And then I always say, well, are you a blood type A? You know, blood type A people have really a high adrenal-driven nature. They can't quiet their mind. In fact, yoga, they're like, oh, gosh, let's get on with this story. You know, it's even too slow sometimes. But that's the very thing that they need because they've got this mind chatter all the time. And so uh, uh, doing meditation, doing prayer work allows you to be in a being state instead of a doing state all the time. And then people say, well, I don't know how to meditate. And I go, sure, you know how to meditate. Have you ever done anything where you just felt like time went by and you didn't know, you weren't even aware of it, you were in your garden and pretty soon, half an hour went by, you were painting a painting and three hours went by? That's moving meditation. All, you're, you're in the Zen moment. You know, you're on a bicycle, what's the euphoria of just that kind of that motion? So of course everybody has done some form of meditation whether they realize it or not. But then again, when we do uh, concentrated meditation where you're actually doing your breathing uh, and you're trying to, I, I like to do uh, commentary meditation because I have a very busy mind too. And so if I'm just listening to melodic music and I start drifting off into, you know, what's the next thing I have to do or gee, the refrigerator needs cleaning out. And oh, no, 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 come back here. But when I have uh, a commentary, it's a voice saying, okay, now I want you to, you know, imagine the white light circling the bottom of your feet and as it moves upward. So it's giving me something to put my attention on. And for me, I find that very, very effective. And so again, you know, whatever, uh, you know, you resonate with, I, I really feel strongly that everyone should practice at least, you know, five minutes of meditation two times a day, morning and evening. And it makes a huge difference. Um, I was listening to Deepak Chopra. I went to one of his uh, workshops, and he said that Stanford did a study that when in one week of meditation, that it actually increased the telomere growth. And the telomere, it, 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 that determines how long you're going to live. And so I thought, wow, that's really powerful. In one week of meditation, they actually increased their lifespan? Well, meditation's for free. You can do it. Anyone can. Um, I talked a little bit about the EVOX. Deep breathing exercises are really important. How often do we breathe out in a way where we're really expelling from the diaphragm? Not very often. In fact, most of us walk around in a tense position all the time, <laughs> right? In a panic state. And so we get a lot of carbon dioxide in our lungs. And then we have less respiratory <coughs> respiration. Then our, our cells get less oxygen. So I say, let's just do some conscious breathing, all right? And then what does that mean? What does it mean conscious breathing? I mean, being consciously aware of your breath. So I tell patients, well, there's a couple of easy ways to do it. You can lie on the floor, you can put your hands on your tummy, you can, you know, if you take a deep breath in, allow, allow the natural rise of the belly, and as you exhale, allow the natural release of the belly into the floor. You can do it like that, and just kind of, I like to think, you know, cool and cleansing breath in, warm and healing breath out, or just taking your, your thumb over your nostril, breathing in through your left side, covering it up and breathing out through your right side, and then you can see if you're congested or not. And if you have any congestion, then we want to say, what is it that you're eating that potentially is causing you an allergy reaction and having congestion? Most people walk around with allergy uh, feelings and congestion and think that it's just seasonal, but they don't realize that what they're eating, their immune system is fighting. And so this is why, you know, as a nutritionist, I always ask patients, what blood type are you? And they say, well, blah, 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 blah. And I say, and then I start talking to them about their personality, what foods do best, and I say, oh my God, that's me. How do you know me? You, I just walked into your office. And I say, because blood type has a blueprint. You know, it has a blueprint, a, a genetic blueprint. In fact, in, um, in Japan, they actually hire you based upon your blood type. Blood type O, <laughs> their CEOs and presidents, they get the job.
job done. The type A's, they are the executives. Boy, they can multitask, they can, you know, they run good under stress. Blood type B is everybody happy kind of people, right? They're always like uh, trying to keep the balance, they're very creative. Blood type AB, you know, they'll sit and listen to you for hours. I say, if you don't have an AB friend, go find one, right? Because they're the do-gooders in life. And so, it, so you can kind of get an idea. If I embrace the neurotic side of who I am, there's no surprises, okay? I say, well, if I have a tendency to be this way, then what are the safety valves that I use? Okay, if I'm an adrenal-driven person, how am I going to protect my adrenals? How am I going to de-stress? And again, the first place we start is detoxing the body. It's so, so relative to having homeostasis and balance in the body. Um, so detoxification methods, clean up your diet. This is the first thing we talk about is, you know, again, what is the quality of food? People say, well, is organic really that important? I say, well, it is very important because of the overload principle that we're already experiencing within the air and the quality of the minerals in the water, uh, in, the, in the ground. It's extremely important because you don't want to have pesticides, herbicides. You don't want to have hormones as hormonal mimickers in the body. I, I tell patients, not everything has to be organic. If it's thick skin like an avocado, uh, we can get away with not having it, or a lemon, things of that nature, but if it's thin skin, you've got to have organic. It penetrates right through the skin. And so often I tell patients, you know, it's not that expensive. You can go to farm to market, you can go to, you know, a lot of places now say, you know, locally grown, but of course you've got to find out is it locally grown without pesticides? This is very important because you go to the market, and the, the farm to market, and there's beautiful vegetables, and the lettuces are this big, and you're just like, oh man, and you're like, you know, is it organic? Well, no. And it's like, oh, all right. But the demand becomes greater when we consume more. And so, again, you know, eating foods that are not of natural nature are really, you know, going to be very toxic to the body. Uh, food is a drug. And you have a dopamine receptor site in the brain that's always looking for sensory pleasure. I tell patients, the things that you choose to eat are really based upon your emotional state. You know, I tell patients who are adrenal driven, you like crunchy salty things, don't you? They say, oh yeah, I love chips. Hey, the crunchy salty, right? You're trying to replenish the adrenal glands. You know, I said, so everything like chocolate or dairy, those are eliciting a, a, an emotional response in regards to what your body's looking for to create you know, happy hormones in your brain. Your body loves you. It's doing whatever it can to keep you, to, to keep you in a survival mode. It's like if I'm depressed, I can't get out of bed and work. You know, if I don't have vitality, you know, I'm not going to be able to run away from you know, the predator. So our brain is constantly monitoring our emotional state. So the placebo is saying, well, go have some dairy. It's got, you know, uh, casein morphine in it. You're going to feel really good after that. Or go have some, some bread. You've got some gluten morphine in there, and you're going to feel very stimulated. It's like a, a heroin to the brain. So when I ask my patients to get off of, you know, gluten and get off of dairy, they're like, oh, man, my favorite food, cheese and bread. And I go, and I'll say, oh, I love it. I go, as soon as you said I love it, you've got an allergy reaction to it. Your body has become addicted to it. I need that to make me feel good. So whenever someone says, I love that, I kind of giggle underneath and I just say, okay, that potentially is going to be your allergen. So just do it for 10 days. Get it out of your system. Then take it. See the expression you get. Because I will guarantee you, you'll have a very overt expression whether your body said yes or no to it. You'll get a mucus reaction. You could get a pulsing uh, heart rate. You could get even little little hives. I mean, there's a variety of things that your body maladapted to because you ate it and continued to eat it, and it gave you a response like 